Why punish? What justifies doing it? Various answers have been given to this question. Two of these answers have emerged as the most prominent, deterrence and retribution. They have a continuing influence. The deterrence answer was proposed by the gentleman pictured on the left, Jeremy Bentham, the English reformer and philosopher. Bentham founded the school of thought known as utilitarianism. In Bentham's view, nothing counts but pleasure and pain. Laws are legitimate insofar as they increase the net of pleasure over pain across the population. Punishment, being the infliction of pain, is always bad unless it prevents greater pain. Laws exist to prevent pain and promote pleasure. A lawbreaker causes pain or prevents pleasure. By threatening pain to an offender, she and others are deterred from violating the law, and over the long run, there will be a greater net sum of pleasure. The gentleman pictured on the right, Immanuel Kant, was harshly critical of utilitarianism. Kant agreed that punishment is intentional suffering, and agreed that, as such, punishment needs a justification. But in Kant's view, punishment is justified because, and whenever, it is deserved by the offender. Those who offend against duly enacted laws always deserve punishment as retribution. In Kant's account, it is utterly irrelevant whether an act of punishment does anyone any good or deters anybody. Retribution is the point of punishing, and retribution looks only to settle old scores. Bentham's future-facing deterrence orientation is all wrong, according to the retributists. Both theories agree that punishment is justifiable, but they disagree about what serves as the justification. Both theories have to address a further question. How much punishment is justified? Both retributivists and utilitarians accept a principle of proportionality. Both theories accept that punishment must fit the crime and that excessive punishment is never justified. As his proportionality rule, Kant adopts lex talionis, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. So for Kant, capital punishment for murder is not only justified, it is required. A society that fails to execute murderers brings blood guilt upon itself. What about the theft of a horse? Kant did not address this question. Presumably, a horse for a horse would fail to deter horse thieves. Horse thieves would in fact have an incentive to steal, since all they had to lose was a horse if they got caught at all. Bentham can easily justify punishing thieves to any degree necessary to deter thievery. But Bentham, notoriously, had trouble explaining why only the guilty should be punished. If nothing else would avoid a greater loss, Bentham seemed ready to sacrifice an innocent person on the gallows. In a nutshell, retributivism holds that punishment is justified because it is deserved, but only in proportion to desert. While the deterrence theory holds that punishment is justified to reduce crime, but only the minimum invasion sufficient to deter. Mixed, or so-called hybrid theories, have been proposed to improve upon both the pure deterrence and the pure retributivist theories. One such mixed theory, defended by the British legal philosopher H.L.A. Hart, distinguishes the general justifying aim of punishing from the principle of distribution, which tells us how punishment is to be administered and to whom. 
The general justifying aim can be utilitarian, and at the same time, the principle of distribution can borrow the retributivist ban on punishing the innocent. A bit like having one's cake and eating it too. There was a period of time, only decades ago, when a wholly different theory of punishment, rehabilitation, was influential. The vast bulk of criminal prosecutions are brought against poor people, many of whom have been deprived of opportunities to escape poverty. The idea of rehabilitation is to make up for this deprivation by educating, training, and counseling, which is intended to reintegrate the offender into society. Utilitarian critics of rehabilitation argued that statistics showed that rehabilitation does not work. Retributivist critics argued that offenders do not deserve to be rehabilitated. Still other critics claim that there exists a class of super-predator offenders who are incapable of rehabilitation. As prison populations grew in the 1970s and thereafter, legislatures were unwilling to budget the resources needed to fund rehabilitative programs. Rehabilitation as a goal fell out of favor. This has begun to change. Today, restorative justice is a term you may be hearing. Restorative justice has several components. One of them is to try to reconcile offenders and their victims. The hope is to restore the bonds of community. Restorative justice also involves rehabilitation. The restorative ideal acknowledges that society itself lets down its citizens in failing to take offenders seriously as persons. Restorative justice is easy to grasp in terms of the minimum invasion principle. There is a growing public awareness that our culture has allowed itself to become excessively punitive. As retributivists and utilitarians would agree, an excessive punishment is itself a wrong. Moreover, a society that maintains public order only by means of the threat of punishment should not then claim to be governed by the consent of the people. 